Uh, the, the last lesson I did in uh, Human Rights Advanced Lesson Part 2, uh, mind control is what that lesson was about, and uh, that ended up getting taken off of YouTube. It ended up getting banned, and because that was my second strike, or my uh, first strike, or whatever, second time getting banned, uh, I got a seven-day timeout period. So, uh, unfortunately, the lesson today is not going to be live-streamed on YouTube. I'll put it up on YouTube tomorrow once my seven-day timeout is up. And um, But just want to remind everybody that uh, with YouTube censorship and uh, social media censorship, it's just getting, getting worse and worse. And uh, it's getting more and more inevitable that uh, the more truth you put out, the more likely you are to get censored. And so uh, I have begun to live stream also to Sermon Audio. And all of my lessons are being uploaded there and archived there. So if for some reason I'm not showing up one morning, it could be because I was banned again or got my channel taken down or something like that. But uh, the material will be available there on uh, Sermon Audio, and I'm going to be looking into other platforms as well, uh, trying to get set up with Rumble to do live streaming there, and uh, different things like that. So, uh, just having to adapt to the times that we're in. Uh, bear in mind that when it comes to Sermon Audio, uh, it will live stream uh, on Sermon Audio, but then for the actual video that was live streamed to go into the archive, it takes about 24 hours. So, just so you know, uh, if you try to tune in later, you know, in the day on Sunday, you're not going to see the live stream until the next day. So I just want to let you know about that. And then finally, I wanted also to say I'm going to shorten these lessons. I know my lessons have been going kind of long. I've been trying to finish up series, trying to cram a lot of information into single lessons. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start shortening these lessons. So I'm going to still cram in a bunch of information in a short time period. It might cause some of the lessons to be extended into parts and things like that. But I think it'll be better for the live stream and for the, uh, these video recordings to do shorter lessons. And also, uh, frankly, it's just a little bit less time in my week that I have to spend in preparing lessons. I am trying to write some books. I'm working on The Time of the End, book two. And uh, just being able to have a little bit more time to devote towards that will help if I make these lessons shorter. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, hopefully that book will be ready within a few months. But uh, today I want to do a somewhat simple lesson on the three great days of prophecy. The three great days of prophecy found in the Bible. And these three great days are three specific days in the future that are of uh, monumental importance. And those three days go by three names in the Bible, or at least... Uh, we can we can go we can call them three names of the Bible. I'll explain a little bit more when it comes to some of these things, but uh, breaking these things down just for the sake of understanding, we have the day of Christ, we have the day of the Lord, and the day of God. All right, day of Christ, day of the Lord, day of God. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you probably know a great deal about these three days and the events that are associated with each one of them. But uh, stay tuned because I'm going to show you some things uh, here in this study that you probably haven't thought of before, or maybe you haven't considered before, and I think uh, you'll find it very interesting. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, and perhaps you're unsure of the difference between these three days, stay tuned because you are going to learn a lot, okay? So, the term Day of Christ, as it's found in the Bible, or the Day of Jesus Christ, as it's sometimes called, uh, that shows up five different times in the Bible. Five times in the Bible, always in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, the day of the Lord shows up 29 times in the Bible. That phrase, day of the Lord, shows up 29 times in the Bible. Most of the time, this is an Old Testament type. Uh, the Old Testament refers to this event a lot. The New Testament refers to this event. The New Testament and the Old Testament refer to the day of the Lord. And then the day of God, you find that twice in the Bible, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and Revelation 16. We'll look at that in a little bit. Now, it's important to pay attention to the specific words of the Bible. Okay? The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, and he says, uh, Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So it's important to pay attention to the words. Now, I say that because a lot of Christian professors in the Christian universities today, uh, they say that the words of the Bible are not as important. It's not about the individual words. It's more about the ideas and the concepts and the meanings behind those words. It's not the words itself that matter. And uh, the problem with that 
is, uh, you know, number one, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> the Bible puts an emphasis on the words, the specific words. Uh, number two, that idea that, it, well, it's just about the ideas and the concepts, you know, the wording doesn't really matter. Well, the problem is that undermines God's ability to serve His words. And number three, uh, that makes the Christian scholar the final authority instead of God, because now you have to have a man to tell you the interpretation of the words. You know, you can't just read the words for yourself and understand it. You need a Christian scholar or a pastor to tell you what it means. So you see that? And uh, then number four, the problem with that mentality, oh, well, it's just about the ideas and the concepts and the words don't matter. The, the problem with that is that thinking will always result in erroneous interpretations of the Scripture. Now, allow me to illustrate this. Is Jesus Christ the Lord? Of course He is. Is Jesus Christ God? Absolutely. All right, well, then we can conclude that, you know, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God must all be referring to the same thing, right? You know, because, I mean, Christ is the Lord, and Christ is God, so Lord, God, and Christ, if that's all the same word, that's all referring to the same person, those must be the same thing. These days must all be the same. You see, the, the problem with that mentality, we have different words, but the concept of the identity of this individual is the same. You see the problem? But we can't make these three things the same. If we do, we're going to have problems. Because these are three completely separate days at three completely separate times. And each one is important in its own respect. And if you mix them together, and if you try to make them the same, if you try to make the day of Christ the same as the day of the Lord, uh, you're going to have problems. You're going to end up with a wrong understanding of future prophecy. You're going to end up with a wrong timeline, as we'll look at here in a minute. And you're going to end up with a wrong perspective of your own future and your own responsibilities towards God in the day and age that you live in. All right, I'll explain that more as we go. Now, my goal today is not to do an extremely in-depth, comprehensive study of each one of these events, all right? Uh, the lesson today and that I'm doing is more of a quick overview to help you see the differences between these days, and more specifically, a pattern that begins to develop with these days. And we'll look more at the pattern uh, next week. But uh, much of what God does is according to patterns, and once you see how the pattern goes... It's interesting that you can start to fill in some of the uncertain uh, blank spots in the Bible that, uh, that, you know, that the Bible doesn't specifically state in black and white, but does seem to imply. And so sometimes you're not really sure about something, but if you understand the pattern, you can see the, uh, the correlations and you can fill in the blanks pretty well. Uh, but, I'll, but you'll see more of that as we go uh, specifically next week. So let's start with this day of Christ or the day of Jesus Christ. All right, as I said... The term shows up five times in the Bible, and when you study the scriptures, it is abundantly obvious what this day is referring to. Go ahead and look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I've got a lot of scripture here for you today, and since this lesson is a little bit shorter, I'm going to encourage you to turn there if you have a Bible ready to go. But Philippians chapter 1, and, and frankly, this uh, lesson is important, understanding these three things. I, I don't know how many Christians would be able to necessarily distinguish the difference between these three days or even know what these things are talking about. Um, and that's not necessarily the fault of the individual Christian. That's more the fault of the pastors and the teachers that are not teaching God's people anymore. Nevertheless, these things are important. If you understand this, this simple concept and the simple uh, distinction between these three things, you're going to have a, 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 an understanding of your Bible that's going to be very, very helpful as you try to read through your Bible. And uh, so anyway, let's go to Philippians 1, 6, and it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, speaking to Christians, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right? So God, if when, when you get saved, God began a good work in you, and he's going to perform it up to a certain point. Notice that it doesn't say that he'll perform that good work up until the day that you, create, that you do a horrible sin. It doesn't say that God's going to perform his good work in you until the day that you fall away from the faith. Or until, uh, you know, name what, whatever you want, until the day you lose your salvation. No, nothing like that. You don't lose your salvation in the New Testament. Even if you uh, quit on God, even if you become an atheist after you're saved, the Bible says God's going to continue that good work in you until a certain time, and that certain time is the day 
of Jesus Christ. All right. So Paul is speaking to saved Gentile believers specifically, and he says that God began a good work in, in them and will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So whatever the day of Jesus Christ is, now some of you are already jumping ahead, you already know what the day of Christ is, but just kind of look at this uh, objectively, you know, and well, what is the day of Jesus Christ? What is that talking about? Whatever the day is, it marks the conclusion of something for Christians, for Paul's entire audience. Okay? And as you'll see, the conclusion for the Christian is the return of Jesus Christ at the rapture, okay, before the beginning of sorrows and great tribulation. All right, so a lot of you already know this, but I'm just going to stick this right here. We got the day of Christ it has to do with the rapture, the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, in verse 10 of the same chapter, in Philippians chapter 1, we see the term show up again. It says that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. All right, so once again, we're supposed to endeavor to be sincere and without offense up to a certain point. So, so what? You know, are we supposed to be sincere and without offense uh, until that day, but then are allowed to be insincere and with offense after the day of Christ? Is that what Paul is saying? Uh, of course not. The thing is this, if you understand the day of Christ to be the rapture, as we'll see more verses and you'll, under, you'll see that, we are to be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. After the day of Christ, we don't have to worry about being uh, sincere and without offense. Why? Because at the day of Christ, we get a new body, a sinless body, and from then on, we, we won't have the capacity to sin anymore. So endeavoring or to be sincere and without offense is not going to be a problem after the day of Christ. It is a problem up until up until here, right? You can be a very insincere and offensive person, <laughs> you know, and offend people and hurt people and cause a lot of problems, but at the day of Christ, <coughs> you get a new body and you don't have to worry about that anymore. All right? So uh, in uh, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in verse 1, the Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, okay, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? So here in this passage we find the day of Christ again, and the day of Christ in the context is defined for us here in verses uh, 1 and 2. The day of Christ in the context refers to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto Him. Okay? That is the day of Christ. The day of Christ is defined as the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto Him. Paul is writing to Christians, our gathering together unto Him. He's writing to Thessalonians. Bear in mind, he's not writing to Jews. Okay? That's important, and we'll get to that in a minute. He's not saying that a bunch of Jews are going to be gathered together to Jesus Christ at the day of Christ. A bunch of Christians, born again, saved believers, are going to be gathered together to Jesus Christ on the day of Christ. Okay? So, uh, Paul's writing to Thessalonians, and so clearly, uh, to understand what that gathering is ta uh, talking about, you have to look at his first letter to the Thessalonians. All right? The first letter to the Thessalonians is in chapter 4. In verse 13 and 17, he clarifies what this gathering together is. Okay? He mentioned it in his first letter, and in his second letter, he's referencing that gathering together. What is the gathering together? First Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 through 17, it uh, says in verse 15, For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, there it is, shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, we call this event the rapture, but if you really wanted a biblical term for it, you could call it the translation, or you could call it the day of Christ. Whatever, it's all referring to the same thing. So when we refer to the day of Christ in the Bible, we're referring to what we call the rapture. The return of Jesus Christ where Christians go, to go up and meet Jesus Christ in the air. All right. Now this is a gathering of saved Christians, both dead and alive. And this is a gathering up into the air, into the clouds. 
Like I said, this is not a gathering of Jews. There is going to be a gathering of Jews, but it's at a different event. This is not a gathering of the heathen nations. There will be a gathering of the heathen nations, but at a different event, not at this event. All right? And this is not a gathering on the ground in Jerusalem. That will happen too, but at a different event. Okay? So it's important to rightly divide these events. Okay? Now, the day of the Lord has to do with gathering of the nations and gathering of the Jews and being on the ground in Jerusalem, but the day of Christ doesn't have to do with any of that. The day of Christ is different. And Paul specifies that before the day of Christ occurs, there is going to be, one, a falling away of Christians, and number two, the man of sin is going to be revealed. But that is not what is specified before the day of the Lord occurs. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is so you can begin to see that these are two separate events. Okay? We're told over and over that the day of the Lord is preceded by something, and the day of Christ is preceded by something. Okay? The day of Christ, as I said, is preceded by uh, a falling away of Christians and the man of sin being revealed. The day of the Lord is preceded by the sun turning black, the moon becoming as blood, and the stars falling from the heavens. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. This is what precedes the day of the Lord. Now you say, well, I know the day of the Lord and day of Christ are separate. Well, you might know that if you're a Bible-believing Christian with a King James Bible. But if you're a, you know, a, a Christian, and maybe you, you love God, you love the Bible, but you have a different Bible version, unfortunately, your Bible combines these two things together. So you can't tell them apart. And I'll show you that in just a second. So that's why I'm, I'm laboring to show you the difference between these two events. There is a difference, even though the new Bibles try to make them the same. All right. So in Isaiah chapter 13, look at verse 9. We're reading about the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord, not the day of Christ. You see why you could have, the Bible could have inserted Christ there. Sure, the day of the Messiah, the day of Christ. But if it did that, you would confuse the two days, right? The words matter. That's why I started the lesson out with every word of God is pure. It's important to pay attention to the difference between the words. So the day of the Lord cometh, both uh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. It says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. All right, so that's a description of the day of the Lord. That's not what you read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> That's two completely separate things. The Bible says in Joel 2.31, 2, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Every time you read about the day of Christ, you're not reading about this, these cataclysms, these crazy things going on in creation. To the, to the contrary, the day of Christ appears to be very uh, specific and, and private to a certain group of people. But this is a, an event that affects the entire world. Okay, uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And then skip down to verse 16. It says, And these people, the, the wicked, are saying to the mountains, and the rocks fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right, notice that in these passages, there's no mention of any falling away of Christians, and there's no mention of any Antichrist being revealed. Nor is there mention, when we read about the day of Christ, any mention of stars falling from the heaven, and the moon turning into blood, and the sun becoming black as a sackcloth of hair, and people crying out to the rocks to fall on them. You see, these are two completely separate events. And... Um, if you have an NASB, I'm going to put the uh, Day of the Lord right here. 
It happens at the end of the tribulation period. Okay? These are two completely separate events. And right before this day, there's a couple things that happen. And right before this day, there's some things that happen. But they're not the same. The reason why they're not the same is because they're two separate events. Now, the reason why I have to emphasize this is because the New Bibles, every single one of them, with the exception of the uh, New King James Bible, the New King James Bible has, the, has its own problems, but uh, it does get this verse right. But all the other Bible versions, whether it's the ESV, the RSV, the ASV, the NASB, the NIV, they all get this wrong. And if you have uh, one of these other Bible versions, you can look it up here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as you'll remember, the King James Bible says uh, we're not supposed to be troubled uh, by uh, the... Uh, let, let me read it for you so I don't mess it up here. Not to be troubled by letter or word, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay, so he says, Paul says, uh, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. That's the King James Bible. Listen to what the NASB says. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you do not, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message, or a message or a letter, as from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. All right, your, the King James Bible said day of Christ. The NASB and the NIV and all the other New Bible versions says the day of the Lord. Do you see that? The day of the Lord. Now, they eliminated the day of Christ there in that passage. And in the passage, remember, it says that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Well, in the New Bible versions, you're thinking the day of the Lord. And if you cross-reference the day of the Lord, you're going to look in Isaiah 13, Revelation chapter 6, Joel chapter 2, and you're going to see about the sun uh, turning black and all the moons and the stars. And what has happened here? They've eliminated the day of Christ here from your understanding, and now you're thinking day of the Lord. Now, what's going to happen in your theology? What's going to happen in your understanding of the timeline? You're now thinking that Paul is writing to Thessalonians, saved Christian believers, right? Just like you and me. And he says, don't worry that the day of the Lord is at hand, because that day is not going to come except a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed. You're going to start getting your Bible all mixed up. And now, now you've got Christians going through the tribulation. You see that? Because they eliminated the understanding of the day of Christ and what day that was. They make the day of Christ and the day of the Lord the same thing. So you as a Christian, in the year, let's say, you know, 2022 right here, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, but the new Bible's eliminated the day of Christ, and now you're thinking you're going to go through the tribulation. And a lot of Christians think they're in the tribulation right now and have to, you know, take the mark and all these things like that. That's and you know and all these cataclysms going on in the world and the global instability. Oh, we're in the tribulation right now. No, we're not. But you can understand why people would think that with these new Bibles, because there's no distinction between these two days. You see that? That's why it's very, very, very important to get your Bible right and to rightly divide the word of truth, like the Bible says. Rightly divide. All right. So. Let's look at a couple more verses here. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Philippians 2, verse 16. It says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. All right? In 1 Corinthians 3, 13, the context there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul's talking about rejoicing in the day of Christ that he hasn't run in vain or labored in vain. It sounds like he's talking about a reward of some sort. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we have the context of the, day, uh, the judgment seat of Christ where Christians are being uh, rewarded for their servants for Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, the day, what day? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And then it talks about gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. But it talks about the day there. Well, what day is that? The day of the Lord? 
the day of God or the day of Christ? Well, let's uh, keep, keep reading. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 1? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. All right, he says, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So you keep seeing this uh, thing where you get to the end, and the Paul is in, admonishing the, the Corinthians to be blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So, and Jesus is going to confirm you until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this continual uh, reference to the, uh, we'll just say, the judgment seat of Christ, because that's the day when it's going to be determined how blameless you were. Right? And you want to make sure that you're blameless so that you can get a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. All right? So it's important to be found blameless at the judgment seat of Christ because your performance as a Christian will affect the rewards that you receive from the Lord. Your performance has nothing to do with your salvation. Your performance has nothing to do with how much God loves you. Your performance has nothing to do with you meriting God's favor. Your performance has, has to do simply with earning rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. All right. So the day of Christ has to do with the rapture and it has to do with the judgment seat of Christ. And as you're going to see, the day of the Lord has to do with the second advent. This is when uh, the first advent was when God was on the ground in the person of Jesus Christ, you know, born in a manger and all that stuff. The second advent, we refer to that as when Jesus is on the ground again, except he's ruling as king. All right. The second advent has to do with the battle of Arma. Ar Ugh, oh, man. Has to do with the uh, battle of Armageddon. All right. Armageddon is not a meteor striking the earth or something like that. Armageddon is Jesus Christ and his armies fighting the Antichrist and his armies. Uh, the day of the Lord has to do with oh, let's see, i got to get my notes together. Oh yeah, the, the judgment of the nations. That's what I want to write here. Judgment of the nations. Alright. Now, uh, turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, and if you look at verse 12, it says, looking for, oh yeah, and then the day of God, the day of God, that was what I was going to show you here, as the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3. All right, so in this passage, in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to have to slow down a little bit, and I might do a advanced lesson at the end of these lessons on this chapter because there's a lot in here and I think there's some things that are misunderstood and there's some wording and even a couple specific lettering in this in this chapter that's important in order to be under, understanding what it's talking about but anyway uh, we'll get to that a little bit later in verse 10 the thing I want to point out is in in verse 10 is talking about the day of the Lord and then in verse 12 is talking about the day of God look at verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth uh, also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. All right? Now skip down to verse 12, just two verses later. Look at what it says here. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. All right. Now, truthfully, both the day of the Lord here in verse 10 and the day of God in verse 12 sound very, very similar. And it is tempting to make the day of God and the day of the Lord the same thing. Okay, that, that is kind of a temptation to say, well, it looks like these two things could be the same because they're describing the same things, the elements being on fire and things being dissolved. And as a matter of fact, you know, the only other mention of day of God in the Bible is Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. Look at what it says here. You have uh, the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. And then in verse 14 it says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. 
the great day of God Almighty. I mean, you could argue that there in that verse you have the day of God showing up. That phrase, day of God, only shows up two times in your Bible. There in Revelation 16, 14, and in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. All right, now, the problem is in Revelation 6, 14, the context is absolutely the second advent. All right, it's this right here. It says, the great day of God Almighty. All right, so is that... Is the day of the Lord and the day of God the same thing then? Okay. If uh, someone said that the day of God and the day of the Lord were the same thing, it, it would admittedly be difficult to prove them wrong, especially seeing as we don't have a lot of mentions of the day of God in the Bible. And the one mention of day of God in Revelation 16 is certainly a reference to the day of the Lord. And the other mention in Revelation chap or 2 Peter chapter 3 sounds a lot like the day of the Lord. So if somebody wanted to say the day of God, according to the Bible, the day of God and the day of the Lord are the same, well, they'd have a pretty convincing argument. However, there's a few questions that are worth asking. Number one, why would the Holy Spirit use two different terms in 2 Peter chapter 3? I mean, you're right there in the passage. Why not use the day of the Lord both times? Why change it to the day of God in, the, in verse 12? So that's, that's, a, that's a worthwhile question. And number two... The fact of the matter is, the Bible does indeed speak of another cataclysmic day that occurs a thousand years after the day of the Lord. And interestingly enough, the elements are going to be burned up at that day as well. If you will, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to put the day of God right here. Now, somebody could argue that's a misnomer, and the day of the Lord and the day of God are the same thing. However, that, all that would mean is there is an event right here that does indeed take place. We just don't have a title for it. So in order just to sim simplify things, I'm going to say, and I think I can argue from the Bible, that this event right here can be called the Day of God. Three different days, three different events, with three different titles, just to make it simple for you. The Day of Christ, the Rapture, the Day of the Lord, Second Advent, the Day of God is going to have to do with the uh, destruction of the universe, the entire universe, okay? And it has to do with the judgment of, we'll just say all, the judgment of all beings, okay? Whoops, I'm going to take that down so you can see it. All right, and uh, this is also the uh, battle of... Gog and Magog that the Bible speaks of. Revelation chapter 20. Look at Revelation chapter 20. There is another event. So even if you did want to make the day of the Lord and the day of God, the verbiage referring to the second advent, you still have an event a thousand years after the second advent that takes place. And if we got to call it something, we might as well call it the day of God. Okay? Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. It says... And when the thousand years are expired, all right? So I have millennium here. Millennium here is just a Latin, oops, that marker doesn't work. It's just a Latin word that refers to 1,000 years. M milla, 1,000, annum, years, millennium, 1,000 years. All right, when the, one, when the thousand years are expired, Revelation 20, verse 7. Okay, so the second advent has happened already. Jesus has already come back. He's already ruled and reigned in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And when this time period is expired, something's going to happen. It says, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay, he's been imprisoned in the heart of the earth for a thousand years. Verse 8, and Satan shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. All right, so... You have the spirit of a devil at this time going forth to the kings of the earth to gather them to battle. Now that sounds familiar, right? It sounds like the same exact thing that happened before the battle of Armageddon that we read about in Revelation 16. It's, it sounds the same, but it's not the same exact thing. Those are two different things. It's as though history is repeating itself. You see? Uh, the same pattern is starting to emerge between these two events. The spirit of a devil gathering battles or gathering kings to battle. 
the spirit of the devil gathering the kings of the earth to battle. We're starting to see a pattern develop. Okay? Then you have verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So they're surrounding Jerusalem. Well, that's the same exact thing that happened at the second advent at the end of the tribulation. The Antichrist and his armies surrounded Jerusalem. And then it says in uh, verse 9, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Same thing happened here. Jesus Christ came out of heaven with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So these two things are very, very similar. But it's important that you distinguish between the two, because obviously there are some differences, because you have this taking place, and then it says after the thousand years were fulfilled, these things take place. So even though they're similar, and there's a similar pattern repeating itself, it doesn't mean they're the same thing. And it's important to understand that. All right, And it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Okay, Interesting. The devil was cast into the lake of fire. Right here, he was cast into the heart of the earth, into hell. Similar, but not the same. And it says, uh, Shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. All right? So at the day of God, it says the heavens and the earth flee away, and there's found no place for them. All right? So you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it sounds like to me that it means exactly what it says. The heavens and the earth are going to flee away, and there's no place found for them. (laughs) Okay? So the heavens, all of the universe, all the sun, moon, and stars and the earth flee away and there's no place found for them that's the destruction of the universe right there that's the end of the universe okay now for the christian you don't have to worry shadrach meshach and abednego were able to abide the fire of god and as a christian you're not gonna have to worry about that but the heavens and the earth are going to be destroyed at that time and the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat you might say all right so Uh, At that event, at the uh, day of God, essentially every electron in the universe splits apart, and you have this ultimate uh, fission, you know, where they've got a billion atomic bombs exploding at the same time, and and, uh, you're left with all that's left is just all the souls and the great white throne. It's just uh, man and God, or all the created beings, sentient beings, standing before God at the great white throne at that moment. All right, and then after that, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, uh, where, you know, new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21 22. So, anyway, I point that out because a similar thing happens. You know, everything that we're reading about here, a similar thing happened a thousand years prior at the day of the Lord, except at this time, only some of the elements were melted and some of the elements burned with the fervent heat. So, I'm just going to put a little explosion right here because the second advent has a lot of similarities but the entire universe doesn't blow up at this time and we know that because jesus has to reign on reign on earth in jerusalem for a thousand years so he can't blow up the earth at that time and there's no indication that he does but there are some similarities isaiah chapter 24 isaiah chapter 24 now like i said if you've if you're familiar with this this is all uh, old information to you but uh, for some of you that aren't familiar with this this is good that you learn this because it, it'll help you in your Bible understanding Isaiah 24 verse 17 the Bible says fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee O inhabitant of the earth and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare for the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake all right in the context we're reading about the tribulation period all right and then it says in verse 19 the earth is utterly broken down now look at that verse 19 context of the tribulation the earth is utterly broken down the earth is clean dissolved the earth is moved exceedingly well what are we talking about at first we were talking about this and now all of a sudden it sounds like we're talking about this is that the case what's going on here verse 20 the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again question is this talking about the second advent 
the day of the Lord, or is this talking about the day of God a thousand years after the second advent? Because it sounds a lot like this, right? It does. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day, okay, which day are we talking about? That day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. All right, well, is that the day of God, uh, or is that the day of the Lord? Which one are we talking about here? Because he does, he punishes the kings of the earth in both of them, you could argue. All right, verse 22, let's keep reading. And they shall be gathered together, the kings of the earth, as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and they shall be thrown into the lake of fire. No, that's not what it said. It says, they shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Okay, that verse right there, verse 22, tells you that Isaiah 24 is talking about this, not this. And the reason why is because the kings of the earth at this time are gathered together and they're thrown into the lake of fire and they are not visited again, ever, ever again. But the kings of the earth at this time are thrown into the pit. Hell, in the, in the Bible, the lake of fire is never, never called a pit. All right, Hell is called a pit. Uh, they're thrown into the pit, into the heart of the earth, and they are visited again after many days. How many days? A thousand years. They're visited again at the great white throne judgment, you could say. So then it says in verse 23, Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients, gloriously. So the point is, Isaiah 24 is most obviously, most certainly is talking about this event right there. And it cannot be referring to the day of God a thousand years later. But I point that out because the verbiage, the verbiage in verse 19 is that of the earth being utterly broken down and, quote, dissolved. Dissolved, verse 19. But that dissolving is not this. The dissolving there, the, wor the verbiage that, that God uses, that the Holy Spirit uses, is dissolved in reference to the second advent. Okay? So the same word is used for both events, but they're not the same, you see. All right? So <clears throat> the entire planet, like I said, the entire planet Earth can't dissolve at this time because Jesus still has to reign in Jerusalem. So there's some, so, so let me put it this way. The elements do melt and do dissolve at the second advent, but only some of the mel elements melt and dissolve at this time, whereas at the day of God, all of the elements melt and dissolve at that time. All right? When Jesus comes back, the Bible says he comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And at that time, the earth quakes, and the rocks are rent, and the mountains melt, and the earth will evidently be vibrating and quivering so badly that it will cause the mountains you know, to be shaken down. If you have a plate with a little, uh, little hill of dirt on it, and then you shake the plate, what happens? Those, that hill melts. It, it, it has the appearance of melting as the, as the dirt uh, dissolves and settles on an even level. Okay, well, that's the same type of thing and same type of uh, imagery with the second advent. When Jesus arises to shake terribly the earth, a lot of those mountains are dissolved. And uh, that's the word that's used. Nahum chapter 1, verse 5, listen to this. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Second Advent. Isaiah 40, verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Second Advent, day of the Lord. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low, verse 19, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for the fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. 
Now you can compare that to Revelation 6.14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Right? So even though the heaven is departing as a scroll at the day of the Lord, that is not the same thing as the heavens and earth fleeing away at the day of God. Right? So it's important to get those things understood. Now I said I was going to go not as long, all right? So I'm going to wrap it up right now, okay? I hope you can recognize that these three days, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God, are not the same, okay? Even though they have a lot of similarities, they also have a lot of notable differences, and those differences are there so that we can tell them apart. They're three separate events, three separate days, with uh, three different set of circumstances and three different sets of people involved in each one of these things. Okay, So the day of Christ has to do with the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ and takes place before the tribulation end time period. Okay, The day of the Lord has to do with the second advent, the battle of Armageddon, and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ takes place after the day of the Lord. Okay, Or I mean after the tribulation. So the day of the Lord, a thousand years. He reigns for a thousand years. And then the day of God has to do with the battle of Gog and Magog, as described in Ezekiel 38. And it has to do with the destruction of the entire universe. And the great white throne judgment uh, takes place after the destruction of the universe. And the day of God takes place after the thousand year millennium. So uh, today we look primarily at the differences of these events so that we could rightly divide the differences between the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God. Next week we're going to look at the similarities between these days, and I'm going to start showing you the pattern that begins to emerge, and uh, I think you'll be able to start seeing some details that uh, maybe you haven't seen before. So I hope this lesson was a blessing to you. God bless you. Hopefully I won't get banned for this lesson too, and we'll see you next week.